start. Are we ready? Okay, I don't see the on air sign, Eric. Oops. <laughs> yep. Still don't see it. There it is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, welcome everybody to Public Infrastructure, Environment, and Sustainability Committee for Monday, April 24th. Thanks everyone for being here. Call this meeting to order. We need approval of the minutes from March 27th. So moved. Second. A discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. We have a packed schedule. Everybody's got strict time limits. I'm not going to be the usual. Um, School marm on this, so just. I'm sorry. What was the second word you said? Marm. Yes. M a r m. Yes. Okay. Can That's, you define marm? It's a derogative term. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. That's all you need. So first up is Mr. Otterstrom, Mr. Carl Otterstrom from STA. We're going to discuss STA Division Street BRT update. This is exciting for those of us on the STA board. That should be for all of our community members as well. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Councilman McKinnear and members of the, the uh, Council and the Pies Committee. Uh, I'm pleased to present to you on the Division Street BRT project and the updated locally preferred alternative. So the project, as you know, is something we are working with the city, Spokane County, and WashDOT in implementing uh, the second bus rapid transit project in our region and the first to have uh, to be defined by FTA as a fixed guideway project uh, as a result of the locally preferred alternative adopted in 2021. And uh, it really is the culmination of our, our efforts back in 2020-2021 to define uh, through a Division Connect study this uh, BRT mode. We are working towards entering into project development with the Federal Transit uh, Administration for uh, um, the next phase of the project later this year. So this is the definition of the locally preferred alternative. Um, it's on the screen. I won't go into all the details, but suffice to say, uh, th there is some renderings here that depict those business access and transit lanes. Again, that's part of the, uh, uh, meets the definition of fixed guideway for uh, having more than half of the corridor in this configuration. Business access and transit allow uh, all turning movements into businesses, side streets, but through traffic is in the center lanes. So the outside lane is, is for transit and the business access. And uh, this is a project we are working and coordinating closely with WASHTA with the assumption this is done basically uh, as that project wraps up th that is the North Spokane Corridor. We also, I should point out, the definition of the project includes a multimodal path along Ruby Street as part of its core definition. So in the last uh, six months, we've been working to refine the definition of the project especially its alignment downtown, its alignment on the very north end, as, as well as the station locations. And so, so through the downtown, there's multiple lines here, it's kind of busy, but the uh, blue and gold uh, represent uh, not just a Mead High School graduate, no, but the uh, alignment of the inbound uh, track going Brown Street uh, to uh, Sprague and then Howard Street. And so that alignment uh, to second wall would be the, the south end, and then heading north, outbound, uh, uh, second to Lincoln, then by the SDA Plaza on Riverside, north on Division Street. Carl, I'm just going to Oh, I'm sorry about that. I was told that was done up above in some mysterious chamber. So, uh, do I get 30 seconds? Yes, yeah, sure. okay. absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, we're going fast. So, north side, we have uh, the alignment uh, traveling on 395 along Division Street uh, as it becomes 395 north to Hastings Road and then east along Hastings and Farwell, ending at Farwell Road and Newport Highway. So, that's all outside the city limits, but of interest, of course, as that area continues to develop. Um, stations along the corridor, so we have stops about every quarter mile along division. We are actually consolidating stops or proposing to consolidate as part of this locally preferred alternative to have stations more uh, closer, a little more than a third of a mile on average apart. Uh, and this allows us to concentrate the, the, the benefits at those station locations while having the speed of travel throughout the corridor. 
Uh, this is the uh, entire alignment shown in one map. map. And uh, we've been working not only uh, doing uh, an extensive evaluation, both from an operational standpoint, uh, uh, ridership modeling, uh, but also outreaching to the communities, 11 meetings with community members, uh, community groups, including neighborhood councils, a virtual open house. We've had a biweekly technical advisory committee with staff from the city, the county, WashDOT, SRTC. We've conducted several meetings with the Downtown Spokane Partnerships Policy Advisory Committee um, and a downtown walking tour with the City of Spokane rep representatives and then it did a direct mailing across the entire corridor, property owners making sure they're aware uh, where we're proposing stations, aware of the project in general, so, and uh, also conducted an online survey. Uh, I'll say we didn't get a lot of negative feedback about the project. There are always people who say, why invest anything in transit? Uh, but otherwise, any questions about station locations have been really minimal. Some questions from uh, property owners about just the business access and transit, how does that work, and really allayed their concerns uh, by ex explaining it in more detail. So our next steps, we uh, actually last week uh, had a public hearing with the ST Board of Directors uh, about this, uh, next, this, this recommendation, which we uh, plan to bring through the STA Planning and Development Committee next week. Uh, for board action later in the month of May. And so, uh, we're, we're, as you probably are aware, the state legislature just adopted the transportation budget. It's programmed over uh, multiple biennia to receive $50 million in state funding for this project. And so, so that will help us uh, leverage future federal grants as well as local funds. Uh, the first biennium, there is uh, just over $7 million uh, appropriated for this project. That is intended to go towards the project development phase, which uh, we expect kind of coinciding with the, the launch of CityLine. We're working to time this out so that we are ready to ask entry into project development in July. Uh, and that takes usually two or three months for FTA to grant entry. So we could begin uh, project development, which is basically all the full design engineering, the finishing of NEPA work, and preparation uh, for a future uh, full funding grant agreement, which we would seek uh, in late 2025. Any questions? Questions? Go ahead, uh, Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, really quick. I'm just wondering um, kind of what the thought process was around the, the downtown portion uh, of the BRT. My, in my mind, it, it feels like it, it might have been a good plan to go up around the arena and then go down Boone and connect with Division that way um, to kind of get more areas uh, covered. So I'm just kind of curious sure. what the thought process was. Yeah, so we did explore that alternative, taking, say, North River Drive potentially over there. We uh, actually have uh, service on Route 27, Crestline, on Washington Street today. We are augmenting next year uh, the uh, Route 11 to run later at nights and weekends. Uh, also this summer, the Routes 26 and 28 coming from Nevada Street will actually cross over at Mission and then down Washington Street. So they'll be during uh, the peak periods between the Route 27 when it goes to 15 minute service plus 26 and 28, a bus every seven and a half minutes, plus the, the shuttle that runs every 10 minutes off peak, or sorry, nights and weekends, there'll be a bus every 15 minutes going down Washington Street by, by that arena uh, area. And so, so is that, does that include, I, I've heard there's been conversation around kind of a, a free bus that would go from the arena to downtown and back? Is so that that, that's not including any other concepts out there, but the Route 11 does operate between the arena to downtown today. And the near-term investment the STA board approved in late 2021, we were planning to implement this year, but uh, due to staffing challenges, we're, we've moved that to next year. That shuttle would uh, run or extend to uh, later at nights and the weekend, so it actually could serve those, those uh, other trips going okay. to arena events. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Just a comment, I just wanna thank you for the outreach. I know that um, we had presentations at some of my neighborhood council meetings. The neighborhoods enjoyed being included in those discussions. And I have one neighborhood that's very, very excited um, because they're close enough to, to utilize it. So thank you. Go ahead. Yep. Thanks, Carl. My question is to build on uh, Council Member Cathcart's. I was just wondering the specific part down to second and why that was included. Yeah, so as we get downtown, one of our challenges is finding a layover spot. And so the STA Plaza is, is well, two things, layover spot and congestion at the plaza. We actually have more capacity at the plaza on Riverside than on Sprague. And so uh, 
the intent was <laughs> can we serve close enough to the plaza and, and um, have a layover and ultimately we, we were looking at Wall Street, the challenge with Wall Street is um, the Howard Street is where the streetcars used to go, so the clearance is actually about two and a half more feet of uh, over height, uh, mm -hmm. overhead clearance. Wall Street, it's very narrow for buses, and so if you have a 60-foot bus and there's snow uh, outside, under the outsides of that would be problematic. So uh, that second wall connection, potentially we could go even farther south of the freeway, lay over near Lewis and Clark and the hospitals, but just basically trying to get south of, of, of the tracks. Okay. Um, as far as the, the um, you see the stations along the way though, Main and Brown, Sprague and Bernard, Sprague and Stevens, all of those have multiple transfer opportunities including people, if, if they have issues trying to get to that last couple blocks of the plaza from say Stevens and Sprague, they, they can make multiple transfers with buses coming basically every seven and a half minutes on the, the combined frequency of those different locations. Thanks. Any other questions? I, go ahead. Just one more point to add. We were working with the DSP to minimize the number of new stops, you know, try to leverage existing stop locations as much as possible. And I just want to add that this isn't just about transit, this is about housing. And so this is an opportunity for density all the way along up mm -hmm. division um, for TOD. And it's it's going to be fabulous when it's done. So thank you for presenting this. Thank you, and thank you for your support and leadership on this project. Thank you. Great. Next up, GFC update. Marlene Feist. GFC stands for um, General Facilities Charges, for those of you who are not into acronyms. Take it away. And we've, we've given you 10 minutes, but Carl didn't take up three minutes, so he ostensibly gave you his three. I might even be able to return Carl's three and a couple of mine. So, okay. Um, so this is just a quick update. I just want to come before pies every month, as we're talking about this, so that we just keep everybody on the same page. That's really my goal here. So um, in April, we're we're still working. <clears throat> um, so we are working to develop the mayor's GFC review committee. So the committee will include individuals representing building, real estate, property development affordable housing, uh, business and community leaders, including particularly um, someone or more, one or more people from the downtown neighborhood, city utility customers, and we're gonna ask a couple council members too. So I hope to have letters going out to folks to ask them if they'd be willing to serve, and we'll have that committee constituted as soon as we can. And then the next thing we'd like to do is bring um, a, a, basically a housekeeping change to ordinance SM3. Uh, SMC 1304 2025. This was the one that had um, a couple of required meter sizes for duplexes and triplexes. So we'd like to remove that language and have the meter sizing for those dwelling units based on either fixture unit counts as in the United uh, Unified Plumbing Code or by an analysis by an engineer, basically. So that would then um, open up the ability for, for those um, kinds of additional things like the ADUs and the, you know, those, those um, housing sizes that we're trying to promote through the missing middle to have options just um, in terms of meter sizes because those were specific in the code and I think it's really more of a legacy thing um, from older style plumbing. So um, we would like to um, put that on the council's agenda to clean that up which will help them in developer services as they're processing new requests for building. And those are my two updates for GFCs. Yes, Go council ahead. member. Yeah, I mean, this sounds reasonable. I'm just wondering, do we do this for, for anything else, commercial or, or anything? No, this was the only place in the code. So we went looking just in case there was any other references where we had a mandatory meter size, and this was the only case. So we really think we're handling it appropriately by having them apply to the Developer Services Center, and if there's a, if there's a conflict, they can turn to an engineer to say, yeah, a three-quarter will work, a one-inch will work, whatever, um, okay. based on the development. Awesome. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry, one quick question. Uh, has there been any more discussion on a uh, potentially like a five-eighths option? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's one that we would like to bring to that review committee to take a look at in terms of what we think might be possible. So I think that's more of a discussion around cost and what kind of things would be needed to support that. It could be that something like a Spokane landscaping might be appropriate depending on the size of lot, that kind of thing. But 
all this is doing is removing reference to a specific size saying that this is mandatory for a duplex or this mm -hmm. is mandatory for a triplex. We, we just don't think it's necessary. Um, you know, fixture counts um, or a hydraulic analysis will serve that purpose. Anybody else? Right, Marlene, okay, thanks it. so much, appreciate it. All right, next up is Catherine Miller on fluoridation study final status update. Thank you, Council. So this is just a quick heads up for next month and the month after in terms of May and June. We'd like to come on May 22nd. Two things will be happening on that day. We'll be releasing the SEPA for comments. That's a 14-day comment period. And we'll also come to PIES and share the links to the actual document so everyone can uh, have their hands on the, the information. Um, um, then we're going to go into June and, and do t three touches effectively. It'll be a briefing on the 12th and with the 19th being the day that we'll, we'll, won't be uh, open for business, the actual uh, conversation for uh, uh, consideration won't be till the 26th. So we'd like to come back for a study session on the 15th. We'll have our consultant come in and take a look at uh, any questions you have, do a deep dive into the study itself and uh, then be prepared to have consideration on the, on the uh, 26th as a resolution. The resolution is only effectively identifying that the study is complete. There is no uh, conversation about any judgment pro or con to the, to the work. It's just you're acknowledging the study is complete so we can say that phase is done effectively and that opens up the next step in terms of the, uh, the conversations that will happen afterwards. Uh, the one point I would like to make on SEPA, this is a study just reminding everybody to understand costs of what it would take. This is not an implementation. This is just a conversation about costs, so you can have the larger conversation. In a study to understand costs do not have an impact on the environment. Obviously, any decisions after that could have impacts on the environment. So this SEPA, to talk about a study about costs, will be a DNS in terms of uh, a non-determinant, uh, there won't be an impact to the environment. Obviously, if the project were to move forward into something that got, gets uh, developed in the physical world, that would have its own SEPA under a project level SEPA with project level details, and a, its own standalone determination would happen at that time. So again, this 14-day SEPA is a, is a DNS to focus on the fact that it is a study around costs. So any questions? Questions, go ahead. Uh, timeline, if, if this were to move forward for implementation, how, what would be the soonest that that could realistically take place? Are we talking years or? It, it comes down to dollars, so we wouldn't have enough dollars today identified uh, to move forward, so we'd have to get into a funding. But if, uh, if putting the funding aside, I mean, if the funding was there, realistically, how fast could the city move to do this? Sure, so as part of the study, we had to make some assumptions, obviously, again, to, to put a cost to it. So in the study, we have it actually built over uh, effectively a five-year period in terms of the first work you go in and, and, and get everything uh, established for the buildings that you need to have housing the, infra or the, uh, the structures. Remember, we've got seven effectively different locations around the city that we would have to go build in. So whenever you pull the trigger, you still have a phasing period that you would have to go through. So again, if we had the money today, you could start it, the phasing periods could start you know, late this year, if you will, but you'd still have a several year uh, layout. Okay, and then my last question, the, what, do, do we know, and you could send it to us via email, but do we know kind of what the total cost was of this study here, and did it exceed the, the grant that we ended up taking from the state? So that's the point of coming back on the 22nd of May okay. to, to share all that information. Our, con our consultants are still working to wrap everything up, so I'd like to give you the, the, the final work. We will say it's a draft when we come to you on the 22nd because I would like to take any comments that we do receive under the SEPA process and put it as part of the document. So you've got a full documentation of not only cost, but at least everything that we've done to capture any information uh, around the topic for, for, again, those future steps. So once we get the comments back, we would come again in the June time period with a final, final document at that point. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I was just wondering why we have, are doing a resolution to say the study's complete. Is that normal? I, 
Just don't remember doing Council that. has in the past taken studies from neighborhoods and done the same effective thing. So I'm actually using those past resolutions mm -hmm. as a, uh, uh, a recipe, if you will, of, of how mm -hmm. to bring it forward. But not necessarily a requirement to do no, it? No, it's just a way to, 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 close, it. to close it down, exactly. Mm -hmm. And again, effectively using what past councils have done. So I guess on council member Cathcart's art. Thanks. Zappone's <laughs> <laughs> uh, question there, what, were to, what would happen if this resolution didn't move forward, if it failed, or if we just didn't have a resolution, what would happen? Nothing effectively. I just wanted to, to again, follow yeah. precedents that councils have done in the past in terms of taking a document that wasn't necessarily having a um, a recommendation or a move forward kind of a statement, mm -hmm. but just to an acceptance statement. And again, yeah. just accepting that the study is complete. Anyone else? Great. Catherine, thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next up, we've got all the water stuff kind of lined up here. So the next water piece is the water quality update with Lauren Cyril. Good afternoon, Council. Um, so we have uh, recently published our 2022 water quality reports, um, and we wanted to touch ba back with Council on recent findings um, that are not actually part of 22's report, but it, they do change our knowledge of the water system. So the city does have a robust water quality monitoring program. We conduct thousands of tests every year. Um, in 2022, as in previous years, we have exceeded all of the federal and state water quality requirements. Uh, new in 23, we tested for PFOS and PFOA contaminants. This is a new requirement by the state. This is not a federally uh, required um, PFOS and PFOA is currently not regulated on the federal level. Uh, Washington State came out with a, a new requirement that water systems test for in 2023. We teamed up with Department of Health, who came out and uh, assisted us with the sample and the cost for analyzing those samples. The current method that uh, DOH is using is a far more refined method now. Uh, when PFOS, PFOA came out, it was, they had a method for testing, but it did not test as finely as it can today. So we tested six of our seven well sites. And we actually have Havana uh, is a new site that is not completed yet. Um, that's in the schedule to, to, to be tested next month. Um, our schedule in March 20, 20th, we tested Park Water, Ray, and Well Electric. On the 27th, we did uh, Central Grace in Nevada. Um, as I said, Havana, because it is not online yet, uh, it doesn't even have the ability to pull out of the well, so we're using a county uh, sampling site that's there. So that's scheduled on May 2nd. We did not test Hoffman Well uh, due to construction uh, that's going on right there that is offline right now. In our samples, we did detect PFOS and PFOA at Ray Street, um, and we detected PFOS at Grace. Um, state action levels, so the current limits that we have for PFOA is 10 parts per trillion. Um, and at uh, Ray Street, we were at 2.7. Um, that is below our action level. It is high enough that uh, reporting limit is two. So it is a reporting uh, requirement, but it is still below the uh, set standards. Um, state action level on PFOS is 15, and Ray Street, we were at 4.4. Grace, we were at 2.01. Again, 
just um, above that reporting limit. So can I, we have a question there, but you mentioned Ray Street, but isn't that a redundant um, well? So is it, is it, it's not necessarily used for drinking, it's used as redundancy? It, it is a drinking, it is a drinking water well. Okay. Um, it does, it, we don't pump from Ray Street in the winter. That, um, that's what I meant to say, these, yeah. Uh, both these stations, Ray and Grace, are typically not pumped at all during the winter. So um, he's not done, but go ahead. I just wanted to say, for context, because we've talked about um, airway heights and their PFOS, PFOA levels, can you share with us what theirs is compared to ours? Yes, sir. We will cover that um, really quick. Um, I do want to cover that, though, uh, put it in perspective. Um, with these findings, we do report that we had positive uh, results. Um, we turned on Ray and Grace for the last two weeks so that we could get water flowing and then we'll test again and see if that pumping, while we're pumping, it changes the, the limits at all. Um, we did test all of our wells in 2015 as well. During, in 2015, that testing limit was 10 parts per trillion. So we couldn't even test at this level. Um, but in 2015, we had non-detected all because we were below 10 at everything. So airway heights. Airway heights had the same detections, but their uh, levels were much higher. Uh, airway heights detected at 1,500 and 1,700 parts per trillion. Um, that difference that bowl of rubber bands, 1,500 rubber bands, ours are four. Um, it is much lower, and we are currently still underneath of those state re requirements. Um, Fairchild, when they had their samples out there, were magnitudes higher than air, uh, airway heights as well. So these are... Um, these are forever chemicals. It is a new concept. Uh, after the 2015 round of uh, findings, it's become very prevalent. And there's much more media and more interest in PFOS and PFOA now. Um, these things are in a magnitude of products that we, we, that we use. We don't know where our findings uh, originated from. Um, it's in Teflon coating in your, in your cookware. It's in waterproofing on uh, uh, clothing, uh, stain resistance in carpets. Um, the most common, the highest can, uh, level is in firefighting foam. Um, it's not the only place that it comes from. It's in all kinds of stuff. Um, so we will follow up with samples at Ray and Grace um, due to... Uh, positive samples being found there will sample those stations quarterly going mm -hmm. forward. Um, that will give us that idea if we're uh, going up or going down. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering if we were over that 10 or 15 limit, what would be, how, how would we have to address that? Because I, I assume this is generally a non-point source pollutant, right? So is there a way to identify the exact specific source and, and mitigate, or would we have to do something significant part, with the whole system? Part of what Department of Health um, teamed up with all of the purveyors to do these samples for, we can get an idea where the contaminant, uh, maybe there's a higher level at one of the stations and we can kind of pinpoint that out. Um, today, we don't know where that is. Um, in the future, we might be able to figure that part out. Um, if we were above 10 or 15 parts per trillion, uh, we would have to come up with a plan. How are we going to mitigate that? Um, there are districts now that are out there that are uh, sampling and coming above those limits. They're, they have to come up with a plan and figure it out. Eventually, um, that, that uh, is going to turn into some form of filtration. Mm, okay. And again, we, we had said that this is not federally, federally regulated. Um, the federal will come out with a standard this year. Um, they have a draft that's out right now. Um, that draft has a lot of different um, findings that are in it and different requirements on, on districts. So uh, as they complete all of their wording and finalize their rule, we'll have a new updated plan. We'll, we'll know more in the future when they approve that.
And moving forward, it is our hope. Maybe we can figure out where it's at and we can clean up the contaminant. Uh, so I have a question. This is water quality update. So what else did you test for? That our, our standard tests are uh, bacteria, E. coli. Those are, those are ongoing. Um, had no changes in, the, in those. Um, all of our other- um, Lead, do you test for lead? We did, um, Doug? Doug will tell you all the samples that we've done since uh, the beginning of the year. I'm, just, I'm looking at this water quality. I'm going, there's more than PFAS. Yes, so part of our routine water quality is about 200 different parameters that we test for every year, about 35 inorganic parameters, including lead and copper in the source water. Okay. And then, but lead and copper that people commonly think of as, as in the tap at homeowners places, we did that sampling in 21 at the required places and didn't have um, exceed the action levels. Don't ask me off the top of my head what the mean value was, but it was well below the action level for that. So 2024 is our next in-home lead and copper testing. Okay. And then on the organic side, besides the PFOS, which is new testing and significantly lower than all the other stuff that we routinely sample for, is about 165 organic chemicals, plasticizers, herbicides, pesticides. And those were all non-detect and have been non-detect for 20 years or so. Okay, good news. Does anybody have questions about that? Thank you. Is it? Okay, Lauren, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. The final water topic is Water System Plan 2023 update, Mark Papage. Welcome, Mark. So keeping, keeping with our water theme, um, so every 10 years we're required to update the water system plan. This is our 2023 update of that. So we really have three plans that lead um, lead to our water system. The, f the first kind of foundational one is this uh, water system plan, which is, it's fact-based. It's, fact um, it's really based on how we operate the system now. It's uh, set to be approved by the Department of Health and City Council this year. And then jumping up from that is our, is our link water strategy uh, plan, which kind of joins the water system plan uh, into the future. That's underway right now. Uh, set to be completed in 2024. And then, and then finally, the top tier of that is the uh, capital facility plan and the comp plan, which is really kind of the water system that we uh, want in the future. Um, that's set for 2025, 2026. So the purpose of the water system plan um, is to demonstrate that our water system is well positioned to provide efficient, high quality service now um, and into the future. And why do we do this? Well, it's required by, um, by the WAC, and it's also um, required by the Department of Health um, to approve construction of our capital water facilities. So what's in the water system plan? Well, there's, uh, it's a total of nine chapters plus an appendix. Um, I won't bore you by reading through all these things, but it's about a 1,500-page document. Um, these chapters are all prescribed by the water system planning manual. Um, so it's nothing we made up, it's all pretty well canned. Oh, goodness. Um, this slide here is just kind of for reference. Most of the information in the water system plan is uh, based on pressure zones. So this is, uh, this is just a map of the city's pressure zones here. We have, you know, of course, the, the three main zones, which are well-fed, um, the low system kind of around the central core of the city. Uh, North Hill up north and then intermediate. So those, those three zones are all well fed. Everything from there gets boosted up into the, you know, kind of the different tentacles throughout the city. So, um, so chapter two of the, of the plan. So we have to address our existing water use. Um, I'll just point out a couple of things on this slide. So the, the graph on the left is just a, a graphical representation of the table on the right. Um, Interesting things to note is just the, 
the discrepancy between uh, summer usage and winter usage. Um, pretty, pretty huge throughout all the pressure zones, some, some more than others. Um, and then the other thing I, I would point out is just if you look at the, even just at the averages, um, those three main pressure zones uh, are using fewer gallons per day than, uh, than some of the outlying ones where we've got, you know, larger lawns, larger homes, stuff like that. So not surprising, but um, well production. So we have to calculate this based on acre feet, which is um, an acre one foot deep. Uh, pretty, so this is, this is all seven wells, uh, three years of data, 2018 through 2020. Pretty, um, pretty consistent uh, between the three years. Um, and it's kind of got that curve that we would expect. You know, it's pretty steady until we get to May when people turn their sprinklers on and then it, you know, peaks up in July and August and then kind of starts to drop back down. So, um, and just as a reference, 12,000 acre feet is about 4 billion gallons, so. I'm just wondering, do we, do we not have data yet for 21, 22? I don't believe we have that information yet, so that's why it didn't make it into this. Okay. Yet. I just think it'd be really good to look at that because we did pass the water prohibition a year ago, and I think it's important to look at how, what impact that has had on, on the system. Yep, absolutely. Um, future water demand. So we, so we have to look at a 20-year window as part of this, um, and that information, we get that population growth. Uh, from tra or traffic analysis zone data, also called TAS data, um, and our current water usage. So if you go down that average day demand uh, column there, down at the bottom, you'll see 11.22 million gallons a day. So that's, that's about what we're projected in that 20-year window. Um, as a reference, you know, we pump right now like 60, I think it's 61 million gallons a day. So, so it's roughly 20% of that. Uh, looking at water rights, so, so we have to look at two different things in the two columns on the left under existing water rights. Um, one of those is flow-based and the other is volume-based. So if I look at just the green number, uh, the 241,000 uh, gallons per minute, um, that's, what we, that's what we're allowed. What we're projected to use is about 182,000 gallons per minute, so we've got a um, surplus of about 59,000 gallons per day. Um, kind of similar on the, on the volume side of things, uh, about 148,000 uh, acre feet is what we're allowed. We're projected to use about 85,000 of that, so we've got it, we're projected to have a surplus uh, of around you know, 62,000. So. so we're in pretty good shape on, on water rights. Um, so we're also required to look at future conservation. This, this is a table that was created by um, the consultant that we had do this work for us, uh, Madaus. It kind of shows this strategy B, which are these are kind of all the things that we're that we're doing right now. Um, you know, education, leak detection, all that kind of stuff. And this table here shows what uh, what they are projecting we would we could potentially save with that. So, um, without doing anything in 20 years, we're projected to be at about 74 million gallons per day. If we implement uh, the stuff in that strategy B, we'd be maybe around 61 million gallons a day. So saving about 13 million gallons a day. Uh, condition, condition evaluated and capacity analysis. So, um, you know, I would just call this like a 20 year stress test basically on the system. You take the, the system we have today and you put 20 years of growth on it and you come up with solutions based on the deficiencies and those are those um, bullets here. So you've got an end to useful life, energy efficiency, growth, public safety and fire flow, reliability, resiliency, uh, and water quantity. This is just some, some examples of, of deficiencies that, that come out of that. Um, I won't read through all these. but. You know, as an example, for a reservoir, we've got Thorpe Reservoir number two in the low pressure zone. Um, this needs standby storage, so um, we're proposing a new reservoir there. Um, deficiencies that's meeting would be public safety, fire flow, reliability, resiliency, and growth. Chapter eight looks at our 20-year um, capital improvement program. I don't expect you to read uh, 
read these individual projects, it just kind of shows how, how things are sort of spread out. Um, the projects in red are, um, are the six-year projects, so years one through six. Blue projects are that seven to 20-year window. So if it looks like there's more red than blue, it's because there is. Um, a lot of the red ones are distribution projects, which wouldn't populate that that 20 year window or that seven to 20 year window. So um, those would show up later. But if, in the seven to 20 year window, we've, we've got a total of 41 projects we're showing, uh, roughly 380 million. Um, and the six year stuff, I think we're around 180, 190 million, something like that. So. So future capital funding plan. So um, a lot of data here. This uh, it's a 10-year window that we have to look at. Um, I'll just kind of walk through walk through the rows here real quick. Um, under under water rates for capital and interest. So that's what we did there is we just take our 2.9 percent that we have right now and project that out. Um, that's probably not realistic for the future, but that's the information we have today. Um, similar on the GFC mm -hmm. side. Um, before the new GFC stuff came out, this, this table was already created, so it doesn't include any updated GFC information. It's, it's just what we have, have today or, or when this was created. So, so it took that number, projected it out. Um, that gave us our, our total revenue. Um, on the operations side, it's effectively just our six-year, you know, stuff that's in our six-year program projected out into that 10-year window plus, um, plus the debt service we pay. So. That bottom number, the ending reserve number, is really kind of the, the tail of the tape, um, you know, which is our, it's our beginning reserves plus uh, revenue minus expenses. So as that runs out into that 10-year window, you can see it kind of gets smaller, 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 and ends up, uh, ends up being negative towards the end, kind of hammering home the point that uh, we need some more resources. So um, and, and another thing I'll note on that, um, you know, those expenses that we have there don't include um, like an aggressive asset management program, which we're going to we're going to have um, if we end up doing fluoridation or anything like that. It's, that those it's not reflected in there um, or any other regulatory requirements like, you know, dealing with PFOS or anything like that. So um, that's that one. Hold on. Let's let him finish. Yes. You want me to go back? Let's let you finish. Okay. Um, schedule. So we submitted the draft of the plan to DOH on March the 10th. Um, we'll have a draft review by City Council between April and June of this year. Review comments we're expecting back from DOH uh, in June and then hoping for approval from the Mayor, Council, and DOH uh, sometime this summer. So, Questions now? Council member, yes. Bingle. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate it. So you said that the, the nine chapters, 1,500 pages, is there yes. a distilled yeah. version for the public that they can look at and, and easily handle and understand what's, what's happening here? Well, um, without the appendix, it's 300 and some pages, so, which nobody probably wants to read that either. Um, I don't know that there is a Cliff, Cliff Notes version of it. Okay. Is this... Close to a Cliff Notes version of that 1500 page, or is this? It's probably the, the closest thing we have today. Okay, is that yeah. something that we can make publicly available? Because 1500, even if you remove the appendices and it's sure. 300, 300 is a lot for yeah, the absolutely. average citizen to yep. get through. So, yep. um, but other than that, can we go back to your water rate, uh, your revenue projections in there? Because yes. I, I see how it goes 27, 24, 30, 27. How did you guys determine the water rates for, for capital and, and interest uh, going through 2032? Yeah, um, I know it was based on, I did not create this table, but I know it was just based on that 2.9% and keeping that, um, keeping that consistent. I mean, those numbers kind of jump around a little bit, but. Um, well, I guess I'm confused how you can have an $8 million difference going down from 2027 to 2028, and then it, and then it goes back up $8 million. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not certain why that. Because that obviously affects the bottom line and the ending reserves and those kinds yep. of things. And so, yep. you see what I'm talking about? I do. Probably it's yep. project costs. I think probably we have more estimates on, on loans going out. In Could the you get closer plan. to the thing? We probably have more estimates on loan on the six-year plan. But Marsh will be back in a week, and she, she developed this, okay. this uh, 
this slide for us, but it's, it probably has to do with loans that we've already accepted for projects, mm -hmm. but then outside of the six-year window, we really don't have that yet, so that is likely the drop. Yeah, um, well, and I, and I see that where in the total revenue, right? So if you start at the revenue top, right, water rates for capital, and then the GFCs, loans, things like that, that number varies wildly based on the loans, but the top number, that's the one that should be pretty consistent or at least going up over the years based on that 2.9% increase. And I see we go from 31 to 27, 26, 29, 21. So yeah, I guess when she gets back, yeah. yeah. Okay. I have a question for you, Mark. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just wondering, do we make change? So we do have this GFC, which is a pretty big change, and we will have heard about the fluoride uh, costs by the time we hear back from DOH. So I'm just yeah. wondering, do we make adjustments uh, before we finalize it, or do we just say, no, we're going back to what it was in March regardless of what happened? So I'm just, I'm just wondering. Yeah, you're about talking that. about this table specifically? No, the whole, the whole thing, the whole report. Because you mentioned a couple times, well, this was before GFCs. I see. And then fluoridation would change everything. And yeah. so I'm just wondering, do we make changes, or do we just – say, hey, this is what we presented, we're gonna stick with it, I'm just I wondering. wouldn't expect us to make any big changes to the, to the plan at this point, because mm -hmm. um, it, it really is supposed to be kind of how we're operating things today, which we don't have that stuff. You know, we, we include some things like future growth, but, but it really is kind of a how we function okay. today sort of thing, so I wouldn't expect that, but okay. um, I, would, I would let Marsha probably make okay. that. Maybe a footnote. Final comment on that, sure. <laughs> I, I just, what I hate, I mean, well, by the time people are looking at this in a few years, they'll be like, oh, sure. wait a second. Yeah, and we, can, and we can amend it at any time. So, oh, okay. So it's a 10-year window. We have to make updates okay. in that window, but we can, if we wanted to come back in a couple of years, we could, okay. we could include amendments. All right. So, yep. Thanks. Any other questions? My ask is that you make that bigger. I'm worried about the people <laughs> yes. that are watching that on TV going, is that an eye chart? Sure. So, It'd be great if it was a little bigger. Right. Or maybe even make it into two slides. Okay. But thank you. All right. Let's move on to six years streets program update. Welcome. Kevin, thank you for coming. Good afternoon, Council. Kevin Picanso, Integrated Capital Management. Again, uh, here before you to brief you on our 2024 through 2029 uh, streets capital program. Um, again, just in terms of our schedule and where we're at today, uh, we've had multiple study sessions uh, with you. Uh, we're at the PIES meeting here today as the standard touch uh, before we come back before the Council uh, looking for approval of the document or a six-year streets program in June. Um, you've seen this slide many times, uh, you know, briefing again on why we take this in advance of and separate from our citywide capital program, and that's primarily because of state law that requires us to have an adopted program prior to July 1st of each year. And again, in terms of the role of the program, it's how and where we implement the, the transportation policies and goals of the comprehensive plan. Um, I'll do an overview of all of the new projects going into the program and update to projects that are advancing or evolving a little bit. Before I do that, this is just a list of projects that come out of the program. So there's a mix here of projects that have been either completed in 2023 or are already out to bid and under construction or will be sh here shortly and we expect to have them complete in 2023 and thus they don't need to be in the program for 24 and beyond. Again, just overview and summary, 11 new projects. I think when I presented to you a study session, there were 10 new projects. There's one addition. I'll go in a little more detail on that when I, when I come to it. This is just a, a brief list of those new projects, and I got a slide for each. And I'll make it brief because we've kind of gone over this before, and I'll be hitting you again you know, in June. Um, but this is the list of the uh, 11 projects going into the program. Uh, and this is a map that just summarizes those locations uh, spread throughout the city, healthy amount in the core, but um, uh, really a wide range in various uh, portions or uh, neighborhoods in the city. Sure. This list, I know you can't read it in here, but it's in your briefing packet. This is what we call the kind of the reconciliation sheet. It's that same list of 11 projects, a little more written detail uh, in terms of the scope of the work for the project. 
then individually going through each of these again, uh, Leitai Bridge. This is really just our initial effort to get, um, get some planning efforts underway, get some cost estimate updates, and targeting some upcoming grant opportunities over the next year or two for this very large bridge that we expect to be up in that you know, 35 to $50 million range. And uh, so we need to nail that down and, and, and start really focusing on uh, you know, finding a, a way to fund this project going forward. Uh, second bridge was a result of a grant award. Uh, it's a Chestnut Street Bridge Scour grant award this last year through the state's local bridge program. Uh, next project here is the arterial PED hybrid beacons. This is a collection of four PED hybrid beacon projects spread throughout the city. You see on the map there where they're located, uh, Regal and Thurston, um, Market Columbia, Nevada Coza, and Wistox Randolph Way near uh, Spokane Falls Community College. Again, this is a successful grant award in 2022 as well. And the next four projects, um, are either from the PED bike safety program at the state level or safe routes to school. Um, you see it highlighted there, their grant award pending. These are being considered through the state budget. That is, I don't know if the ink is dry yet on that, um, on the state budget. But those, as we started this process, they were um, sort of on the recommended list. And uh, of course the state budget wasn't approved as we were kind of getting started with our process here. So we're still showing them as, uh, pending grant awards. Won't go into too much detail today. I did brief these as a study session. This first one is Maxwell, Ped Bike Safety. Includes some protected bike lanes, striped bike lanes, some sidewalk infill, pedestrian crossing um, improvements as well near the park. Next project is also Ped Bike Safety for Le the Lincoln Street Corridor from uh, Summit North uh, past Boone, not quite to Maxwell. This also include uh, both protected and striped bike lanes, some reconfiguration of the travel lanes, um, ADA ramp improvements, uh, some uh, traffic signal upgrades. We will also most likely package street maintenance work with this project. We already had a project kind of on the longer term list to do grind and overlay through not the entire stretch, but I believe uh, Summit to Boone. We'll roll that into the scope of the work for the project and do this all at the same time. And again, this ped bike safety with that pending program. I'm not sure when the governor gets to sign on the dotted line on the budget, but we expect this to be funded uh, in this upcoming biennium. Safe Rouse to School, two, two projects uh, here to highlight. First, Stevens Elementary. This is a mix of sidewalk infill, uh, some pedestrian and crossing improvements, including bull bouts at intersections immediately adjacent to Stevens Elementary. Includes a pedestrian hybrid beacon crossing a mission an RRFB crossing of Napa Street in the vicinity of the school. And again, on the list we've seen, it's in the, it's in the current budgets, budgets at the state level working their way through the approval process. And then the second one from that same Safe Routes to School program is at Scott Elementary. This is primarily sidewalk infill. There'll be some, um, some bump outs and traffic calming type improvements along Hartson as well and then um, sidewalk infill leading to the school itself. Next up, so this is the new addition that wasn't in the briefing and that we had uh, in terms of the two study sessions. So this is a project that's really um, a result of a utility need. So the utility capital improvement process, of course, is part of the citywide process. That's getting underway. So with my coworkers, Mark Papich, who was just up here, they're starting that uh, CIP process on the utility side. There's a project they identified for um, some fairly substantial upgrades and it's been on our long range plans for a while, but substantial upgrades to the stormwater system through Riverside Avenue that will really tear up that street. So this is an example of those integrated type projects that you hear us talk about sometime. So we'll bring a little bit of additional street money to the table so that we can accomplish a full rebuild since you know, a su substantial amount of the street will be torn up anyhow as a result of that utility work. We'll make this a more complete project to get a full rebuild through there all the amenities will be addressed that need to be addressed in terms of you know, ADA ramps, any deficient sidewalk, those, those sorts of things. So this is a new addition. It's out in the out years, um, looking at you know, 28 tentatively is uh, for construction right now. So it's not something that's gonna happen in the near term. You won't see any planning efforts you know, really getting on your way for a couple of years most likely. But again, this is a new addition compared to the uh, list and information I shared with you a couple months ago. 
Then uh, these last couple projects or, or projects were in my previous briefings to you. This one, uh, Maple Walnut Grind and Overlay, it was a successful grant award through the TIB program. It's, those are state dollars. Again, this is a capital maintenance type project, roughly Fifth Avenue to the Maple Street Bridge. Next is Thorpe Tunnels Preliminary Engineering. You heard much about this from Inga as part of the update to the impact fees uh, that were discussed over the last several months. This is that uh, initial step to go a little bit deeper into the preliminary engineering to better define what that project's gonna cost, exactly the approach to getting uh, under and across the two, um, the two areas where tunnels are needed, the, rail, the railroad and Fish Lake Trail itself. And then finally, an impact fee addition uh, to the program. This is a project that has been on that longer 20-year list that's in the impact fee, but we, we incrementally bring projects into the six-year program. This is one up in the northwest part of the city for a roundabout at uh, Assembly Francis uh, Nine Mile. And then this is, uh, this is part of the, in your packet, in terms of the general updates, it's kind of a second list that we, we've called honorable mention. These are projects where we're changing them in the program. They're already in the program, but in this case, they're mainly projects that we're breaking out into phases. So there might have been a single project in the program before, and we're breaking them into uh, smaller increments for a variety of reasons, and I'll get to that here a little bit. Some of those are some of these project updates that I'm kind of summarizing and highlighting here. These projects are all projects that are already in the capital program from previous years. But um, for a variety of reasons, in most cases because of uh, recent grant awards, they'll be able to actually move forward. So now we have you know, real money to put behind these projects. They aren't just out years with unidentified funding sources. So each of these projects will be moving forward. US 195 Meadow Lane, Wellesley Freight of Havana, that was a federal earmark. Uh, Sunset Boulevard Shared Use Path, that's a project on the previous list I just showed you that we're breaking that up into segments, and one of those segments was funded through a, a recent SRTC grant award. Fish Lake Trail, already in the program, but we're breaking that up into three different phases. We have full, uh, nearly full funding for phase one, and then funding for the design phase of phase two. That's a project we'll be moving forward into design uh, here this next year. Pacific Avenue Greenway, that's on that move ahead Washington list of projects, so that looks promising. The, the main dollars are in the second biennium of that kind of list of funding, um, so that this project will move forward as well into design. Spokane Falls Boulevard, that was a partial grant award in 2022 just for the design phase. I think I've mentioned previously, we're already starting behind the scenes, some planning efforts, developing concept plans, but there'll be a very robust public outreach effort for Spokane Falls Boulevard. That's again, that's a full rebuild downtown, significant utility improvements, opportunity for other changes through there. But again, you'll see more on that planning effort later this year. And then finally, Millwood Trail, it's another uh, one of the projects that was included in the Move Ahead Washington list of projects. It's already in the program from last year. Um, but looks like that funding is going to be coming forward, so that project will be able to advance a little bit sooner than later, which is great news. And this is just a, a kind of map, kind of summarizing some of those projects and their locations. So that was it. I'll be coming back to you in June. This is just the standard committee touch, but happy to answer any questions. At any this questions time. for Kevin? You have a president. Oh, sorry. I don't have eyes in the back of my head. Go ahead. Yes, so I, I didn't realize you were going to be presenting today when I sent you an email earlier today, but I'm glad I did. We did get the state budget numbers over the weekend, and then we also got uh, numbers of congressional directed spending on the Palouse Freya uh, and the planning for the Monroe Street Bridge uh, suicide prevention barriers. And so I was requesting that those could be put in. And then the other one, which is kind of a unique situation, is we had some meetings with WashDOT, and they identified the uh, two-way um, extension of Inland Empire Way and then the planning and construction all the way up Empire Way to downtown. That's the top priority that would help get building back on track in Leita. And they promised to help us identify funding. And so I... You kind of already answered that we're putting on new things, even though the transportation subcommittee has looked at this once. But I'd like to see if we can get those projects updated in here so that we could pass it, including that, to help us get those grants and those funds. 
Yeah, I need to digest your email a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, yeah. Just an hour or so ago, but yeah. um, in general, most of that is already addressed in the program, so that's yeah. good news. Um, the projects are already there for the most part. Right. It's just a matter of changing numbers or changing years yeah. where some of that funding yeah. falls, so we can make those types of updates. On Inland Empire Way, that's a study where, where we have a draft of an RFQ already prepared, okay. you know, so we, we'll be getting moving with that and bringing a consultant on board to okay. kind of help with those, that process on that particular project. So most of that stuff is really already in okay. the works. Um, just a matter of yeah. making some minor tweaks. And it's that moving up in the schedule that, with with funding. You know, yes, that's exactly the, with the real the with the real dollars yeah. and the real years yeah. identified. Yeah. So yep. Thanks. That's in the works. Questions? Anybody else? And just to uh, tie into that, uh, the Inland Empire Way piece. I know it was originally slated to be one way, and we're really advocating as is Washtot for it to be two. So that's something perhaps we should discuss offline as well. Sounds good. Great. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, Council President, you're up next. Resolution, regard <clears throat> resolution regarding investigation of use of city records. Yes. Um, so this arises out of a report we got from the Office of Police Ombudsman. Uh, arising out of a different investigation, but they touched on this. And so just by way of background, the Office of Police Ombudsman is not allowed to um, make conclusions about violations of city policy or law. They can make factual observations from their perspective. They're also not allowed to um, investigate directly the chief of police. So in that report, I think most people have had at least access to it, it identified... Um, some troubling uh, communications, again, from the OPO's observation, not, it's not truth with a capital T at this point, it hasn't been independently investigated, but one was releasing information about ongoing investigations that were confidential and would undermine the investigation if released to the public, so that was documented. And secondly, uh, releasing information for lobbying purposes. And there were other concerns as well. Um, so several, we've gotten several complaints about this, uh, and under the code, the municipal code, the, again, the ombudsman's office can't investigate, and what it says is that any complaints against the chief of police shall be directed to the mayor and investigated by human resources. We've gotten lots of complaints around this behavior to us. I've spoke with the mayor's office a month or so ago, and informally and just encourage them to follow the code on it and we did get a letter back from the mayor that seemed to indicate there would not be a following of the code or any investigation and also essentially endorsing the conduct as I read the letter that's how I read it I'm not sure how that was uh, indicated so this resolution is basically just calling out the mayor to do what's required under the code um, and obviously in the last few days, weeks, uh, even making the request to follow the code has become very political. Um, so, and I, you know, I don't know if there's any way around that, but that's what this resolution is meant to do, is just ask the mayor and the administration to follow the code that it's there, because the Office of Police Ombudsman can't do it. Uh, we could, that's another thing, we could change that code. There's not a collective bargaining agreement at issue on there, so we could change that code. But until then, uh, it directs the mayor and HR to do it. So. And, and one more piece as well. The resolution formally asks for an investigation of all non-represented city staff to determine if any actions published in the report from the Office of Police Ombudsman will violate city, po city policies or procedures or state law. So it's not just about the chief, but about um, people who are working in our council office or in the office of the mayor so that we're not just pinpointing the chief and saying naughty, we're looking at ourselves as well. Questions? So, um, quick question. It's a resolution. It goes to the mayor. Does the mayor have to follow it? She can say no, right? I mean, it's, it, there's no teeth in this that says somebody has to. It's just calling out the city code. Um, how the city code gets enforced, city council doesn't get to enforce the city, but an outside person could do it. But the resolution doesn't do that. It's just, again, we tried informally 
to get the mayor to follow the code. And this is just making a little formal of recognizing, because a lot of people don't know what the code says, uh, is my, my sense of things. And there's possibility. I mean, we're just discussing this today. It's not scheduled for a vote. The possibility that the mayor's office, maybe upon further re review, will follow the code. Thanks. Any other questions? Go ahead. So I have a question on, so code says that HR needs to investigate, and in here are we asking HR to hire somebody else to investigate? Is that what we're asking? We're basically suggesting it. Obviously, because this has become political, it may be difficult for employees at the city to do it. Um, so, I, I mean, I would, my, this is just me, preference, is that the mayor would direct HR to do it, but if HR doesn't feel comfortable or our city legal doesn't feel comfortable for understandable reasons, uh, get it outside. We've done that before. I joined the council right in the middle of such an outside investigation from dating back to Chief Straub. And then even a year or so ago, there were some allegations against the city administrator. We quickly went out, had an independent thing, and then it was, you know, the, the clamor in the community seemed to go down once someone independently had looked into it, so. I would also add that four council members were investigated independently too, um, back before you all were on. It's just the three of us that were on. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we were all not investigated because we're squeaky clean, but <laughs> some of the other folks were. And so it's, it has precedence. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Well, yeah, I guess one thing I'm wondering, because I think there's a lot of probably technical aspects of the report that should be discussed here publicly, and I'm just wondering, will the ombudsman be here to answer questions next week when this is on the, on the agenda? It's not on the agenda yet, but I think we could get the ombudsman person to come answer questions. Yeah, I think I, I, that's about, that might be a good next step. I think it's important that we have an understanding of just how comprehensive uh, his look was. My, my understanding from the report is that it was based on kind of a, a narrow search, not a comprehensive search of his entire communications, which I think would be the only way that you could get to that point. And so um, I, just, I just really question kind of some of those details. I think the public should have the opportunity to hear some of those details um, and make sure that we all kind of are on the same, uh, same fact sheet going forward. That's a good idea, thanks. Anybody else? All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are finished and we are going to adjourn. Our next meeting is May 22nd, 2023. We do not have a six o'clock legislative agenda tonight because there was only, what, one or two things on it. So we will conclude all our business at the 3.30. But, and can I just raise that at, in a few minutes, the sign up sheet for testimony including open forum, consent agenda, and the couple of resolutions goes live so people can sign up if anyone happens to be watching. Thank and you. we'll probably, are we going to have someone out here to be yes. signing in? Okay, or you can sign in in person. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you in a few minutes. <laughs>